I was born in 1926, and I had, have, still have, a brother who uh, was born in 1922. My father had a, my father and my uncle uh, had a business uh, that was a um, uh, barber shop and, and barber shop supplies and some uh, that, that also included soaps and perfumes, which you would consider drugstore supplies in, in this country. But it was um, wholesale, uh, what would be like a job. Uh, obviously, they did not manufacture those things. They, were, they supplied all kinds of things. One of my early memories is going uh, downstairs and going into the part that had the barber shop, and my cousin and I would try on the different wigs. It was lots of fun. We moved to an apartment which was over the, my father's business. And my uncle and his family were in the same circumstances, so they moved to the same house. I didn't understand it at the time, but Actually, my first memory is of my grandmother coming up the stairs after voting and making the remarks, well, it doesn't make any difference, but I did it. And of course, I didn't know what she was talking about at the time. But um, this would be 1933. I think my first personal memory is the fact that we could no longer go ice skating. Uh, they had a very nice ice skating rink in Cologne, and my father was a good ice skater, and he would take me and my brother, and we would go ice skating together. And uh, one day we said, well, can, why don't we go ice skating anymore? And he said, well, um, Jews are now not allowed on the ice skating rink. And I think that's my first memory or my first inkling that things were changing. Also, um, I was no longer allowed to attend um, uh, public school. Actually, that is earlier, um, because that would be in 1934. And my ice skating memory, I think, is a little bit later. But I was no longer allowed to, neither were any of the Jewish children, allowed to go to public school, so we went to um, Jewish day school. By the time I went to um, middle school, you know, I was almost 11, uh, if you didn't see the handwriting on the wall, you were pretty dense. You know, I mean, everybody saw the handwriting on the wall. Fritz Klebanski. Uh, he was the director of the um, of the school I went to uh, uh, up till 1939. Uh, there was a, there was, it was like what you would call middle school here, and it was it was separate uh, from the grade school. And um, he is a man who is responsible. He arranged for part of his school to be transported out of Germany to England. And it's a rather involved story, but he made arrangements with um, congregations in, um, in England to sponsor these children. This is a little b this is before the officially kinder transport that England uh, went ahead and uh, had. And he was able to uh, move, I think, four of his classes to England, about 120 children. 
And then, of course, um, he himself was deported. He and his family were. And he and his children, and he had four sons, um, were killed in the Holocaust. His, his wife and his children. And it has been a very sore point with me all of my life. Sore is not the right word. Sad. So this man headed up the school that you attended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was responsible for saving the lives of at least 100 students that attended that 120. school. 120. He stood up to the Gestapo from what I read in the Jerusalem Post about him. Mm -hmm. Were you one of those children? Yes, I was. Crystal Nath was triggered, so to speak, because um, some lower, I, I, don't recall the name right now. One of the uh, people attached to the French embassy was shot by a young Jewish teenager. He was not, I mean, a, a, a very important official, which doesn't mean that he should have been shot. He shouldn't have been shot. Nobody deserves to be shot. But he was not, it was not like it was a horrendous thing, like the ambassador was shot. But this gave the excuse for mob violence, uh, which was led by the uh, SS and whoever wanted to join in with it. First it was that because of this outrage, the Jews were going to be charged um, a fine. And then another thing and another thing, I don't remember, it's sort of boiling up. And uh, because uh, that whoever the man was wasn't shot on, on November the 8th. And I don't know when he was shot, but it was several days earlier. So my uncle and my father went to the train station and they got on the train and they went somewhere and then they got off and bought another ticket and went somewhere else. So my father wasn't home on, on that morning. Just my mother, my brother, and my aunt Emmy, who lived in Vienna, but she happened to be visiting. My cousin and I, my cousin Albert and I, uh, I, I'm almost the same age. I think we're like 10 days apart. So we were very good friends and of course went to the same school and we always walked to school together. On the way to school, we would often encounter other kids walking to school who were in the Hitler Youth and we would be harassed. We'd be called dirty Jews. We would have stones thrown on us. So there were lots of different ways that we could get to our school. And in, we soon learned not to take the same way every morning. We went different ways. We went to this side street or that side street, which was easy in Cologne because the, 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 we lived in the center of town and the school was in the center of town. So we went to school. And we decided to go along the main street, uh, well, the main business street, where all the department stores were, and, 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 and a lot of them were owned by Jewish people. And we saw that the, the windows were smashed in and, and everything, but we thought that was very strange. But we didn't stop to talk to anybody. And we went on to where our school was, and again, the school had a, a courtyard. On the, as you entered on the right was the synagogue, and then there was a courtyard, and uh, immediately as you entered facing you 
was the school building, which was several stories high. As we got into the courtyard, we, um, we saw that the synagogue, the windows were smashed, and the, the Torahs were lying in a big heap in the courtyard. Uh, all the religious objects, the um, talit, everything, and it was burning. In the, in the building, in a school building, the windows were open and people were throwing things out of the window. And there was nobody around that we knew. So we got scared and we ran home, really ran home. When we got home, I went to, to my house and he went to his apartment, Albert did. And I walked in and my aunt was sitting at the dining room table crying. My aunt was the most optimistic person any, that ever lived. But she was hysterical, and that scared me even more. And then I hadn't been home but a few minutes when the mob came down the street, and they smashed in the door. And they went into the courtyard, and, and uh, there was SS and a whole bunch of other people. Probably our neighbors. I don't know who they were. And they went in and they uh, they went into the business and they literally smashed everything in sight. Well, as I said, my father was in the wholesale perfumery and barbershop supply business and there was a lot of stuff to be smashed. They ripped the shelves from the sides of the building, and and they were literally like a like a V, like a tent. When we went down there, they were just like this, you know. You could walk underneath them like you were walking in a tunnel. But that we didn't find out till later. They did whatever they had to do, and my mother would not let us go near the window, so I don't know what they did, and she wouldn't go near the window. My mother must have been somewhat naive, because she got on the phone to call the local police. And of course, nothing happened. At the time, I didn't think she was naive, but now when I look back on it, I think she must have really not been, you know, she must have thought, well, the police is here to protect me. She'd lived there all her life. I mean, I can see why she might do it. But of course, my mother got on the, on the phone to call the police, and I don't know whether they hung up on her or what they did, but nobody obviously ever came. And pretty soon, these people started coming up the stairs. And the entrance to our apartment was like frosted glass. It wasn't a solid door like you have in this country. And we could see them standing outside it. And they were talking, and for whatever reason, and to this day nobody knows why, they decided not to come into the apartment. They left. And that was Kristalna. Now, you have to understand that Dr. Klebanski had his ducks in a row, and he didn't start Kristalna to try and arrange whatever he was arranging. I was a very fortunate young woman. There was a lot of discussion before my parents agreed to send me to England. And I remember I nagged my parents to go. I, I do remember that. and. The discussion was, my parents weren't sure of that. That's what they ought to do. And, um, but I remember I was quite, I nagged them about it. Well, some of the kids were crying. 
some of the uh, some of my friends brought their dolls and stuff like that. I didn't, and I didn't cry. My mother and father took me to the train station, and they said goodbye. How aware were you, being twelve and a half years old, uh, about the gravity of the situation? Well, I was very aware of it. I mean, like I said before, uh, my life was impacted by it, and I don't know what I knew on a subconscious level that if I didn't get out of there, I wouldn't make it. I don't know. We went through Holland, and, and for some reason the train stopped there, and I don't, and, and, and people came to the train and um, were very nice to us. I remember that. We got to London and um, we were supposed to be set up in a hostel, but the hostel wasn't quite ready yet. My parents had to supply, had to um, supply and ship uh, my bed and and a shrunk for my stuff and linens and stuff like that, and as did all the other parents, and um, they were going to furnish this big house, a uh, two forty three Wilsdon Lane, in London, uh, which they did furnish eventually. But when we got there, it wasn't ready. So we were asked to stay, we, we weren't asked, we were told that we would stay with different families until such a time as the um, hostel was ready. And then we did, and I stayed with the family and got my first, first culture shock when I was served cornflakes the following morning. I lived in the hostel until war broke out in September 1939 in Europe. And um, then I was evacuated along with all of the English children. All of us were evacuated to the Midlands. And I ended up in Northampton where I again lived with a foster family, although this time not Jewish. And in Northampton was a very small Jewish community, and it, and we were somewhat of a, I, yeah, we felt like we were very conspicuous. I stayed in Northampton for about a, a year and three quarters or two years, and. By that time, I was 14, and school was no longer an option. In England, at that time, you could leave school at 14. So school was no longer an option, and uh, the British government didn't think they were responsible for my livelihood. So I, we, we went back to London, and we went back to the hostel where we had lived before. Uh, but the hostel had changed <laughs> because um, some of the boys that had been in uh, Manchester had come back to London before us. So on the, uh, the hostel had three floors, so the second floor had became the boys' floor and the third floor became the girls' floor, and it was very interesting. However, I have to add that the congregations that had sponsored us had their own problems. Their fathers, brothers, and sons were all in the English army, and they really weren't terribly concerned about us all. So we had to scramble around and find jobs and support ourselves, which we did, working in a um, a factory that made mine sweeping coats as a sewing machine operator. I knew how to use a sewing machine. I mean, that was something somewhere along the line you were taught. 
And so I, I worked there uh, until 19, uh, until January 1944, when I got a visa to come to the United States. My brother um, stayed in Germany with my parents because there was no way out. My parents incidentally tried, I, I had correspondence of my father starting in 1936, which I have since given to the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, where he tried different avenues to get out of Germany. My brother was able to get out in late August of 1939, about a month before war started in Europe. Um, <coughs> my uh, father's cousin uh, put up a visa for him, and he was able to get um, put up a guarantee, it was called, an affidavit. So he was able to get a visa, and he came to the United States in September of very early, well, it must have been August, because September 3rd was when World War got. He enlisted in the American Army, and in those days, I don't know whether that's still true today, but in those days, if you were in the American Army, you could apply for citizenship within I think I don't, three or six months. I, I know it. I think it's six months, which he did. So then he was able to get a visa for my parents, because while the visas were very, very, and, and I wouldn't say few and far between, but there weren't enough visas for all of the people wanting to get out of Europe, all of the Jews wanting to get out of Europe. But the government did make an effort, the American government did make an effort to try and keep families together. My parents um, had a passage to be on a ship that was going to leave Lisbon. And they had the visa and they left Cologne. And they had to, uh, it just took, it, and, uh, it took over 72 hours for them to get out of Cologne and into Lisbon. Well, the ship had left. So they, they, there they were in Lisbon with a visa, but no way to use it. So the, um, the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, which is part of the uh, United Jewish Appeal, uh, took them out of Lisbon and brought them to Barcelona, Spain. And there they were supported by them for just about a year until they were able to get another passage. The visa expired. First the passage was gone. Then the visa expired. So then they got another visa. Then they got another passage. And finally, in 1943, they came to the United States. One of the first things they did was apply for a visa for me to come from London to the United States. And that took about a little over a year. So I came to the United States in January of 1944. I got on a troop ship that was empty that was going back to Canada, to be exact. It was a Canadian ship, and this was this big ship, and there were 27 people on board it. And uh, there was only myself and another young woman. The rest of them were all businessmen that were going back and forth on lend-lease business. My mother had uh, three sisters and one brother. Two sisters and their family, well, one of the sisters wasn't married, but two sisters went to Argentina in a very circumventious way. And the brother went to the United States. And my one sister did not leave 
and she and her family perished in Minsk, in a camp in Minsk. Or at least Minsk is the, the last record that the Germans have of her, which both my brother and I looked up at the Yad Vashem in Israel. History seems to have come to the conclusion that the fact that Kristallnacht was allowed to happen without any objections in the international world, that that was the start of the Holocaust. And it was the start of the uh, tremendous persecution against not only Jewish people, but also uh, other people that killed 11 million people in camps, in gas chambers, six million of which were Jews. And I think it's important to remember Kristallnacht so that if something else along these lines occurs somewhere, people will stop and say, this isn't right, something ought to be done about it, before it mushrooms into such a tremendous tragedy. Kristallnacht was upsetting to me as a child. It's upsetting to me when I think about it now, but it was not a tragedy. There were many people killed, but, it, but if the world would have spoken up, why, surely it wouldn't have been 11 million people just annihilated and 6 million of them Jews. I realized that World War II, many, many, many other people died, young people in the, in the services. And I, I, I don't mean, I mean, I think you almost have to include that in there. All those deaths, all those tragedies, I just think that it's absolutely important to stand up and say what you think is right, and I've tried to lead my life that way.